is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology, innovation in the legal industry, and the impact tech is having on the law. I'm Chad Main, the founder of Legal Services Company Percipient, and on today's show, I have a conversation with career coach and legal recruiter, Emily Witt. She and I talk about what it takes to make the jump from law firm life to the in-house legal department at a tech company. When I was a kid, all I ever wanted to be was a radio DJ. So much so, in fact, that I set up two turntables. Well, I guess they were probably called record players back then. But I set them side by side. I got out the family's cassette player, hooked the microphone up to it, and they created my own radio station in my bedroom. Now, I know I'm not the only person in the world that wanted to be a DJ and set up their own bedroom radio station. But until I met this episode's guest, I hadn't met anyone that actually admitted to doing it. On today's show, I'm talking to Emily Witt. She's a legal recruiter and career coach specializing in placement in the tech, health, and life sciences industries. Right now, she's with Whistler Partners. And not surprisingly, since she too wanted to be a DJ growing up, she's a fellow podcaster and has a great podcast called Beyond the Legal Lens. It focuses on career advancement and specifically how to get jobs in the legal tech and health fields. Before Emily joined Whistler Partners in 2019, she worked many years as an internal recruiter for the Wachtell Lipton Law Firm in New York. But as we will hear, she didn't have aspirations to become a legal recruiter the minute she stepped out of college. Her career path took some twists and turns. After she got an English degree from Colgate, she thought she wanted to be a journalist, but she ended up finding a job in publishing. But as she tells us, she wasn't long for that industry. After a chance meeting with a travel companion while waiting in line for the bus, she took a trip with this person to Europe. And when she came back, she started trying to figure out what she wanted to do professionally. Emily's also a rock climber, and after a European vacation, a big firm lawyer became a rock climbing partner. And this is the person that suggested to Emily she should get into legal recruiting. And as they say, the rest is history. The twists and turns of Emily's career underscores what she will tell us about trying to get a job with the legal department of a tech company after working in a law firm or a completely different industry. She will tell us to get the job, you need to be flexible. Specifically, she says you got to be willing to jump to a different firm if you're not getting the type of experience and work that tech startups are looking for. She also emphasizes the importance of networking. And also, if you can work for a law firm that is already servicing tech companies to clients, that will go a long ways to helping you land that legal tech job. But we'll hear about all of this in good time. But I want to get back to this DJ stuff. So I grew up in the 80s, just to give you a reference point, and At that time, that's when having, I listened to the radio a lot in the car, particularly on road trips and driving to school. And it was also around the time where prank phone calls were popular. So (laughs) already, (laughs) and, you know, my best friends and I, we would have sleepovers and the technology now that is sort of a lost art form, so to speak. And I enjoyed the creativity of it, and I loved music. I loved all different kinds of music, and I also loved listening to radio shows. And back in the 80s, our options for entertainment were limited. Either you were outside playing, which I spent a lot of time, or you were in your bedroom. And I loved to read and talk, and so I had an audio cassette recorder that I would use to play. I would talk about current events. I'm this (laughs) eight, 10 year old kid (laughs) talking about major life events. I realize that I do not have the tapes anymore and it breaks my heart, but that's how it started. It started with just having a lot of time on my hands and looking for a creative outlet and knowing that there was this booming radio station talk DJ audience out there. I I thought it would be a lot of fun and and I just plugged away at it. So now, you know, as a fellow podcaster, maybe we're contributing to the death of radio, but it's so funny you bring that back about the eighties and the love of music and radio, you know, the DJs back then were personality. I mean, you actually tuned into a radio station for the personality. Now I, I know that still exists, but Definitely radio has changed, and but that, that's, that's just cool. And your music thing, too, that you, you bring that up reminds me. I listened to a few episodes of your podcast, and at least on one or two, you asked the guest, you know, what's their go-to song? What's yours? I have a few, but I think one of the ones that I use when I need that extra push 
is, I'm pretty sure it's a 90s song, and the artist is called Chumbawamba. Yeah. And the title of it is I Get Knocked Down. And I would say, not that I have so many moments where I'm feeling knocked down, but I do find that music is where I go when I am knocked down. Right. So that song repeatedly has helped me remember where I was, that I've I've been knocked down before, but I always get up again. And I would say that song has always been my theme song. I think it came out when I was in college and I know it was it was big on the radio <laughs> going back to radio, but somehow regardless of what I've been through, I seem to find myself always standing back up again. And so I would say that would be my go-to song. I I love that. I love that. Another thing I noticed too is you wanted to get into journalism, but you ultimately didn't. You got into publishing. So why the switch? Like why the change? Because when you first come out of college, you go and get into into book publishing, but which is similar to journalism and not. So what happened? I think I was interested in both. I was an English major at Colgate and they had a book for English majors. Not a book, it was a pamphlet. And years ago, I found it when I was cleaning out uh, my parents' home. And it was what to do with an English major. And back then, they pretty much placed all of the options in the same book. And there were so many parallels between book publishing and journalism that I was pretty open. And I had names of alumni in this book that I could reach out to. And I was amazed. I did it by the phone. We didn't use email back then. And I would call names listed in this book. And some of them were in publishing. Some of them were in journalism. But it was all of these former English majors. And it ultimately led me to an alum who at the time worked at a company called Bantam Doubleday Dell, which got acquired by Random House right as I was getting the job. And so for me, the publishing versus journalism route was really happenstance. And that happened to come up first. I was very interested in, I love to travel. So I thought maybe I wanted to write for a magazine for Condé Nast Traveler. And I thought, okay, I'm fresh out of school. It was the late 90s. And back then, there were a lot of options. So it was more a learning experience. And it just so happened that the alum that I had reached out to, she was in the marketing department. She put my resume in front of my then sort of future boss. And I was offered the job on the spot. And that set me up in publishing as that first gateway coming out of school with an English major. But then you get into legal and specifically legal recruiting. How does that happen? Because that's a complete 180. This is a great story. I'll try to shorten it for the purpose of the show. I spent a couple years in book publishing and it didn't work out. And What about it didn't work out? What happened? It was difficult for me to advance, I felt, and I was living at home at the time, reading manuscripts on the weekend, and I didn't see a future. And I also thought that it was a a little bit less about reading for me than a business. And, you know, with that in mind, maybe I should have been a college professor, but I just felt that there was something else for me out there at the time, and I know this is still an issue, I mean, the pay was very low and I was seeking something else. But in addition to not feeling like I was talented, which is such a shame, but I felt, you know what, let me try something else. And I quit that job with nothing, absolutely nothing. I love the story. I met a woman online at the bus in the Port Authority terminal who was traveling to Europe and she was looking to someone to go with. And I went and I quit and that uh, sort of ended the path 
in publishing. Let's back up on that. You met somebody on public transportation and you went on a trip yes. to Europe. Correct. Wow. Yes. And in fact, I am still friends with her. I was a bridesmaid in her wedding. Wow. Uh, it worked out. We had never met before. We spent... <laughs> I do very well on public transportation and just in general, I'm very open and I meet people organically. And I also have a good sixth sense of whether or not I will gel with someone. And I met this person online, the physical line for the bus, and the bus didn't come. And we spent five weeks together in Europe <laughs> and came back and <laughs> she's still one of my closest friends. But I think that also translates into my recruiting job. I have a very strong sense of people and who can gel with each other. So I took a chance. Everyone thought I was out of my mind, but we had a great trip. And I came back. I was very into rock climbing. And I started from scratch. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I was a rock climber. And I started going to a rock climbing wall that was near Midtown because at the time I was still living at home in the suburbs of New York City and I needed to get home. And I met a woman who was an attorney at Cravath who became my climbing partner. And we would talk about careers. And I thought maybe I might want to do something in human resources, in recruiting. I did not have exposure to this at a liberal arts college. And she put me in touch with the recruiter at Cravath. That recruiter did not have openings. The recruiting offices were much smaller back in the day. And so I went on one or two interviews based on my conversation with this Cravath recruiter. I thought, this is interesting. Let me explore this route. And I found myself in the back of a Barnes & Noble on 82nd Street with the vault book of the it was the best guide to law firms, the physical <laughs> book. And I wrote down the names of all the law firms and all of the recruiting contacts at these law firms. And I remember sitting, I don't, I literally was on the floor with my notebook. This is the early 2000s. And I blasted my resume out to probably over 200 recruiting directors. And I got a call from, a woman named Ruth Ivy at Wachtell Lipton, and she was interested in speaking with me. And next thing I know, I am now a recruiter at Wachtell Lipton. You were at Wachtell Lipton for several years. Yes, 15. But then you went out outside the law from recruiting to a third-party recruiter. Why the jump? You know, another life just takes you story. I thought I wanted to open up a Pilates studio. Oh, wow. I'm a Capricorn, so I do things very calculated. So I wanted to take a Pilates training course, and I was still working at Wachtell and then starting to realize that I needed more time in the evenings. And when you're a recruiter at a law firm, you have a lot of evening events, whether it's a summer associate event or a fall associate event. And I decided that I might have a lot more evenings to myself if I went over to the search firm side. And I gave that a try. And that was in 2016. I went over to search firm recruiting as opposed to law firm recruiting. And I've been doing that ever since. And however, I did not open up a Pilates studio. <laughs> I had a role that allowed me to do both at the same time where I managed a studio. But uh, about four years ago, I decided that my heart was in this corporate world and, and I wanted to go back to recruiting all in. And that's how I ended up at my current search firm, Whistler Partners. If there's one difference between recruiting internally in and for a law firm versus the agency route, what is that difference? I would say when you're on the law firm side, and it depends because there are so many different roles within recruiting now. But for me specifically, the big difference was you were not doing as much outreach yourself. So for example, most of my recruiting days were spent with the on-campus summer program 
or onboarding lateral associates, which is a lot different than being on the other side, being a search firm recruiter, where you're out and you're using LinkedIn and you're cold calling or now cold emailing. I do that more often. Or even, for example, my podcast is a way to get my name out there. So I think the biggest difference was that at the law firm, the candidates are coming to you. And this is my experience. Some other recruiters at law firms do do calls. And then versus going to a search firm, now I'm the one doing the outreach. And I would say that is the biggest difference. The other piece of being a law firm recruiter is there are pieces of it. For example, I handled all of the immigration matters for the law firm. I enjoyed that. I also did a lot of the mentors. And the, the fun piece for me was that I orchestrated the summer program. That is something I miss and not something I do as a cert firm recruiter. So now you're at Whistler Partners. You've been there for a yes. couple of years now. Let's say you and I, we're waiting for the bus. We're waiting for, we're waiting for the, the, the MTA. We might end up and in Europe. I, start... I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah <we laughs> maybe. And we start talking and you tell me you work for Whistler Partners. And I ask you, what do they do? How do you describe them? We work at the intersection of uh, tech, media, and entertainment. So not only do we work with lawyers who are at firms, but we also work with attorneys who are in-house. And we're right in the middle. So we are working with both the lawyers who are looking for roles at these in-house clients. And then we are also getting calls from startups and tech companies that want to hire these types of candidates. And I would say that is what stands out specifically regarding Whistler Partners is that we do focus on tech and startups. And you specifically, you focus on law, obviously, and health also. Correct. That happened organically. In fact, that started with a Facebook message. I am one of those people that just follows the paths of things. And I was actually on the phone with a former Wachtell Lipton associate who had moved over to a biotech company. So he had already left Wachtell and was at a biotech company. And we were exchanging messages on Facebook about where to eat in Brooklyn. And... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> One thing led to another, and he said, oh, I see now you're a search firm recruiter. This is so great. My biotech company that I'm currently working for, we're looking for a corporate counsel. And that was my gateway, and I still have to thank this person for exposing me to this area of the law where now I'm starting to specialize in working with biotech companies and life sciences companies, and now more recently, digital health companies. But that initial outreach started my interest, and now I built this book within this specific area, and I've carried that with me in my career and keep expanding this health component. When we come back in just a minute, Emily tells us the advice she gives her clients about making the jump from law firm life to in-house at a tech company. And she says, sometimes it's not the advice they want to hear. I'm Chad Main, and you're listening to Technically Legal. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient. Legal services powered by technology. We'll go back to my conversation with Emily Witt in just a second. But before we do, like I always do, I want to let you know if you go to tlpodcast.com, there's a dedicated episode page for this episode and all others. There's more information about our guests and links to some of the stuff we talk about. And you can also subscribe there. If you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at cmain at percipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at percipient.co. Or you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. 
All right, let's get back to my conversation with legal recruiter and career coach, Emily Witt. She's just about to fill us in on what she tells her clients when they ask her how they can make the jump from law firm life and move in-house to the legal department at a tech company. I would say I feel this question once every couple of days. And I think the answer is surprising to a lot of attorneys, particularly if they're in big law. And they might have even have already made the switch once. And this message also applies to litigators. It applies to corporate attorneys. Where you need to go is a place that is offering you the work and also have the client base that services these in-house clients that you're interested. So for example, if you're not in a department or a practice group that is doing the kind of work that our in-house clients are looking for, it's counterintuitive, but often the message is you might need to go to another law firm if you are not currently doing the work that you do. Now, it's easier to stay in one place. However, I've heard you talk about this before. A lot of law firms are siloed, right? And so it can become very political to make an internal move. Usually that can be the first route. Now, the type of work that you would want to get is anything that touches startups, whether even if you're in a regulatory role or you're in a litigation role, what involvement can you get with AI companies? What involvement can you get with life sciences companies, crypto companies? What kind of privacy work? What kind of work can you do that is tangential to what our in-house clients would like to see? What clients are you servicing? Or if you're in corporate, the advice would be the same. What companies are you working with? What kind of work are you doing that aligns? If you are not seeing that at your law firm, our advice, and I'm telling you, lawyers do not want to hear this. I know this, but it's coming from my heart and not from a sales perspective. You do need to go somewhere else so that you can get exposure to that kind of work. And there are plenty of law firms now that are offering opportunities for you to have that work. And that would be the next step. Well, let's go back to that, the siloed part. How important is it? Because an in-house lawyer is, for lack of a better word, depending on the size of the legal department, more generalist, especially these tech companies that are smaller. They got to have their finger on the pulse of employment law. They've got to know how to do, you know, deal with uh, corporate transactional work. They got to deal with litigation. So does the candidate win out that has a lot of exposure, let's say to employment law and some exposure to litigation and corporate law? Does that person win out versus the person that has only exposure to employment law? I would say the person who wins out in this situation has the most clients in the startup and tech space. So law is very, as much as I'd love to change it, we're very into our name brands. So what clients are you servicing? Particularly, we see a lot of clients recruit their law firm attorneys. So Usually, the person who wins is the person who has access to that client base. However, I would say it's really helpful to also have what we would call tech transactions. It's important to know licensing and commercial agreements and NDAs if you're looking to go to an in-house client. But there are ways to do it if you just have litigation experience, if you just have employee benefits experience. And that would look like you need to have those clients on your resume and as clients that you're serving. Let's say I start setting the table for this. I maybe move firms to get exposure to a different kind of law than a firm that has more tech companies as clients. So I'm doing this. I'm bolstering my resume. What's the next step? I'm I'm ready to make the move. Where am I going? What am I doing? 
So there are a couple of ways. I will say in-house, you can be speaking to a lot of different recruiters when you go in-house. It is a very tight market, and it's a little different from going the firm route where we all have exposure to the same jobs at firms. In-house is a lot of connections. So for example, I'm a recruiter and I specialize in digital health and tech. I most likely have clients that are reaching out to me and my search firm looking for candidates. But that doesn't mean I have access to every digital health opportunity out there within in-house. So if you're at a law firm, we advise you speak to different recruiters uh, if, if you want to go in-house. That is one way. The other way is to use LinkedIn and get yourself out there directly. I would say that is how a lot of jobs are found is through networking, particularly at the in-house level. If you're a litigator, you might reach out to general counsels who have had that path as well. They might be more open to your background, but that would be the start to go out and find this in-house job. But if you do not have that experience, you should strongly consider another law firm. You just mentioned there that the tech space is very connection-driven, relationship-driven, which that's not unique to that, but it seems to be more acute there. First thing that pops in my mind is you got to get that out there and network, <laughs> meet people. Like, what types of stuff should a lawyer or someone in, you know, in legal that wants to move over to the legal department of a tech company? What kind of networking opportunities are out there? What, what should they be thinking about? Where should they be looking? I think LinkedIn and social media is a great way to connect with people in this space, and so. You can do individual outreach to someone that might have a similar path as you. You want to schedule a 10-minute Zoom call with them. That would be one way. There are a lot of LinkedIn groups, Facebook groups out there. And all you have to do is type that in, you know, we'll say tech law in-house and your search parameters, in-house law jobs. That is one way. There's also another organization that we work pretty closely called Tech GC. Right. They have a lot of interesting networking events and do a lot of great stuff. On that note, Tech GC, it's invitation based. You got to be basically a GC or head of the legal department. So these networking events they have, are they for those that are not also GCs? Do they open it up to the public? To my understanding, there are subgroups that they have. And even if you can't get into their invitation only events right away, you want to certainly get in touch with people who are members and ask them what they do, how they network. But I think anyone who is a member of that group would certainly have a lot of connections and also be a good resource for you. I also think a lot of the bar associations are doing specific events for lawyers interested in tech. The other thing is podcasts, our medium that we're using right now, listen to them. Right. And by the way, you have a great podcast for this, Beyond the Legal Lens. And it talks about, you know, just career advice, how to change jobs, how to find jobs, how to excel in the jobs you do. So highly recommend it. And you have a couple episodes focusing specifically on interviews with people in the, in the tech industry and, and in legal. Absolutely. I had one recently, Jeremy Mufelder. He was an associate in big law, and he's now a GC of a virtual reality company. So his path is very interesting. And so thank you. Yes. And that being said, going back to the podcast, I would say there are so many podcasts like yours out there. And so listen to the speakers, listen to the guests, send them in a note. I found your your path really interesting. I'd love to connect with you. Find out what else they've spoken on. The other idea, too, with these podcasts, a lot of the podcasts now are having paid subscription. In fact, 
I'm having a call later today with someone who also hosts a podcast and has a paid subscription. And I want to be a part of her community. So that would be another way to get yourself in front of people because they also do networking opportunities. I think podcasts are a fantastic medium for exposure right now. You've been doing this for going on two decades, right? Yeah. Pushing that. Just just over. I'm (laughs) close to 25. Well, I'm ahead of myself. (laughs) When you started, you were in house at Wachtell and, you know, computers were being used and the, 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 the law firms, the way they were doing business had changed, but it's still early days. The internet's still fairly young. We'll call it maybe 10 years at best when you start. How has recruiting changed generally since when you started back there at Wachtell versus now at Whistler? What's different about it? It was an interesting path because when I first started at Wachtell, that was right before this. And and it's it's interesting because not everyone talks about this. It's the internet bubble burst. <laughs> yeah. And everyone was panicking and we put a lot of things on hold. And so I remember when I had first gotten there, there was talks about everything. And then we just put the pause on the internet. And then slowly but surely, things fueled up again. And then we hit the financial crisis of 08. And I think firms retracted a little bit. Firms not only retracted on their clients, but they retracted on their workforce, et cetera. And so now here we are, we're I'm going into search firm recruiting and tech recruiting as we're starting to pick ourselves up out of what I started with. And so what I started with was you graduated from law school and you were a lawyer at a large firm. You were a lawyer. You were possibly maybe working at a smaller firm. Maybe you would decide to become a solo practitioner or you joined a larger public company. So now what I'm seeing in our world that we're in now in 2023 is the startup world has exploded. Crypto has exploded. And so we had a record number of SPACs recently, right? So now we have all of these companies out there and they just keep growing. So what we're seeing is in the shift in big law Not only are large law firms servicing these startup clients, which makes it really cool because larger law firms now are offering opportunities to break into this kind of work. So we're seeing that. And I saw a lot less of that early on in my career. We're also seeing boutiques pop up left and right. So you're seeing law firms, the elite firms are branching off And they're starting their own boutiques, whether they're litigation-focused or emerging company-focused. They're starting to recruit talent that came from similar backgrounds. So I would say we're seeing this record number of boutiques out there. We're also seeing a lot of people that want to do fractional general counsel work. So because there are so many startups, there are... A lot of needs, for example, uh, pre-seed, seed, seed, Series A, a lot of these startups can't afford some of these law firms. So people are offering their services, attorneys are offering their services as fractional general counsels, and we're seeing that explode. In addition to going over and working at a startup, years ago, You could not be a first or second year associate and find yourself in-house. We're seeing that a lot more frequently now. I think it's a really exciting time. In fact, I probably would have considered law firm life had the world that we are currently living in been exposed to me back then. Emily, this has been great. Appreciate your time. Appreciate the conversation. People look for a job. They want to get in the tech space, specifically Biotech, how do they get a hold of you? I am on LinkedIn all the time, and you can find me at Emily Witt, and the company name is Whistler Partners. There are a lot of Emily Witts out there. I also 
have a website called Beyond the Legal Lens, and you can find me there at beyondthelegallens.com. And then I also have a podcast, Beyond the Legal Lens. I am also on Instagram at Emily in Recruiting. And I can't thank you enough, Chad, for having me on the show. It's, it's been a pleasure. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. Also, if you like us enough, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.